There's a difference between men and women. Men are not women and women are not men. Lawsuit stated that they were forced to let him in to a sorority. I don't know why they let him in. The Hollywood, the woke types, the left, none of those same people are willing to stand against rape and murder and barbaric acts. Because they're Marxists without a moral compass. Hamas and Hezbollah. When they say occupation, they mean the existence of Israel. They mean get rid of Israel. All right, guys, most of us know what it's like to be without power, sometimes for an hour, maybe a day, a couple days after a natural disaster, a hurricane, a windstorm, you know, whatever. But now national security experts are warning that our power grid is more vulnerable than ever. And they've identified nine key substations, which if attacked, they're saying we could lose power for months, months. That's why having your own solar power is more important than ever. So I recommend the Patriot Power Generator, which is a solar generator that you don't have to install in your house. It's portable, you can take it with you. You can use it inside your house. And it's powerful enough that if power goes out, we're talking your phones, your tablets, your computers, medical devices, even your refrigerator gets power. So if you go to fourpatriots.com and use code SPICER, you get 10% off your first purchase. It's four. Patriots.com includes that Patriot power generator. You'll get a uh, that guarantee for a year, free shipping if it's over 97 bucks, and a portion of every sale is donated to charities that support veterans, right? That's great. So go to fourpatriots.com, use code SPICER, fourpatriots.com. You do not want to be without power in case something happens. It's Thursday. This is the Sean Spicer Show. We have a great panel coming your way. Radio host, Tony Katz of the morning show out there in Indianapolis on WIBC. Also, you can follow his show on the YouTube channel at Tony Katz, that's Katz with a K, not like herding cats here in Washington, D.C. We'll get into that. Also, Larry O'Connor, the host of WMAL's O'Connor and Company right here in the nation's capital. All right, please take time to subscribe, support the show, Go to Apple Podcasts, go to Spotify, go to YouTube. I always appreciate your show. Without further ado, let's bring them in. Larry Joe, good to see you. Thanks for being here today. Larry, I know that under court order, you have to be here, but Tony's here under his own free will. Yeah, well, you know, sometimes you got to give back. That's right. I appreciate that. Am I uh, allowed to speak yet? It's the Am Girl I, Scout is motto. Is this the time when I speak? Um, so let me just start with the serious stuff because I, I want to get that out of the way. The thing that I thought was interesting about Biden going to Israel is when I was in the White House, a, a domestic trip would have taken days to turn around. Like if the president said, hey, I want to go do this, there were some ways around it. There's, uh, th there's some ways that the Secret Service would permit it. But the idea of going into an active war zone with a, a number of days, I, I think is frankly risky. The, he wouldn't go to East Palestine, uh, Ohio, but he can force his way. And I also thought, by the way, just to throw this out there, it was interesting because Zelensky of Ukraine had wanted to go and they said he can't come, but they're letting the president of the United States. I get it. Tony Katz, what, what do you what do you think about how this has all gone down? Well, I think the, the Zelensky one made perfect sense to me. If you're Vladimir Zelensky, you can't handle it all the attention not being on you and your war. And, and there's reasons for it of ego and reasons for it of, of security. You want to tie yourself as much as you humanly possibly can to what's going on in Israel, what's going on uh, with, with Netanyahu. So of course you want to be there because you want to say your fight is our fight and our fight is your fight and play that kind of game. Israel has a different point of view, which is, yeah, we got to take care of this thing. You figure out your own stuff. So I understood the Zelensky thing. And, and look, I will, I will hit on Biden for every bad thing he does. And even though he gives this very strong speech about having Israel's back, the proof will be in the doing. I right. don't believe him at the quick because I don't believe his party, which is filled with, as I say it on radio many times, uh, with Jew haters. I mean, there is a massive part of this squad and other parts of this party. There's a serious anti-Semitism issue. But if you're the president of the United States showing up in Israel, it is in and of itself a strong statement. And for everything I could take away from Joe Biden, I don't think I can take that one from him. But, but Larry, I want to say this. I get it. Going there, I will give the president, look, President of the United States, it's risky going there. Uh, it shows, as Tony said, uh, a sense of solidarity. We stand with Israel. It sim Symbolism matters in these moments. And I will give the president of the United States credit for this. But I will say that a lot of the reason that 
were in this is that they tried to pacify Iran. They didn't believe, I mean, you saw Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor a couple of weeks ago saying, there's been no time in, in the last, whatever, couple decades where we have had such peace in this region. And it's where I've spent my, the, the least amount of time. They, they took their eye off the ball. They empowered Iran. And now they're basically like, hey, we're going to go solve the problem. Yeah, that's right. And listen, the optics may be great for him, and maybe he's trying to create B-roll for his presidential campaign next week. And yes, of course, it matters that he's there. But, you know, if he had a solid track record, he wouldn't need to fly uh, halfway around the world to show that he has solidarity with Benjamin Netanyahu and the people of Israel. It would have been a given. It would have been a no-brainer. But the fact of the matter is he cannot remove himself from his policy and from his personnel, which, as you know, Sean, is policy. And the fact of the matter is he financed through six billion dollars of fungible money that was given to the Iranian regime, who's funded Hamas and Hezbollah for the last several decades. He let this happen through that financial assistance, period. End of story. And he can't remove himself from that. And to take up Tony's point, you know, on 60 Minutes this weekend, Biden repeated that same trope that he keeps saying that this is not your father's Republican Party. Well, guess what? This ain't your father's Democrat right. party because Harry Truman was the first world leader to recognize the state of Israel. And I'm pretty sure that Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and all the academics and professors who love supporting the Democrats, they wouldn't agree with Joe Biden's Democrat party of the 1940s. You know, Tony, the thing that I think is interesting is prior to this, these barbaric attacks that Hamas launched in Israel, the narrative around Biden was his campaign is stuck you know, the, the the donors aren't happy. The establishment's not happy. He's too old, Democratic. And and once this happened, the media literally just started talking about how great he was doing, his response. They've ignored all of the stuff leading up to it. It's this, I believe, is the media's way of propping up Joe Biden and showing, you know, despite what you think, he's ready to go. And the thing that I was thinking, because I just real quick, is that when he for forego for forwent forgo forgotten whatever that trip to Pueblo, Colorado? They said it was to stay back and to deal with national security issues. Now I, I've been in the White House. I've traveled with the president. You can take the White House wherever you want. There's a you know they can meet on the plane. They can I mean th that to, to suddenly suggest that he had to stay there to oversee this was nuts. Okay, but my I, point I is, know, huh? I want to know where you saw that the press was saying he's doing such a great job. I mean, they're always lying and, and you see it better than, than than most, but I swear to you, I have not seen that story. Oh, I'm sorry. I think, look, every time that I turned on the television, I was like, President Biden continues to show strength when it comes to this. He stood uh, on and, okay. and it's, it's sort of like, they're, they're propping him up to show that like he, like last night when they, a couple nights, whenever it was that they announced this trip, they started saying this is going to be risky for him. It's tough. It's like they're doing the job of the White House comm shop talking about how tough he is, how decisive he is. The night that he gave the speech when he came out four days later, four days after hosting a barbecue and spending a weekend being interviewed by the special counsel in the classified documents case against him, he finally comes out. And the media reaction by the media was, wow, what a speech. He showed Israel what a strong partner we are. And I'm like, Dude, the, you didn't take Netanyahu's call for, what, six months, and now you're the strong partner? You explain well why this show matters, why Larry's radio work and, and work over there on Twitchy matters, the stuff that I do uh, matters, because how could you possibly rely on these people telling you that Biden comes across strong? Let's go back to the very beginning. It took 12 hours from a state for a statement from the White House, from the key ally of Israel, 12 hours, and you got to wonder whether they were actually weighing the idea of, hey, Israel needs to show some restraint here. Yep. They didn't realize the barbarism that had taken place, the rape of women, the setting people on fire. They didn't really, they had to wait for that to come in before they knew that, oh, maybe we can't say that. 12 well, and also hours, on your you show, say to me, that's not Tony, long, uh, that's little, a ton little of prop, time. Little, little prop here, but I know and you've been covering this about the intelligence failure, right? So they deleted a couple tweets. I mean, they, they, these guys for four days were like, hey, what the heck happened?
They, they were for four days, maybe what the heck happens. And, and maybe Larry, because he's in D.C. and has a little more insight in this than, than I do. But I think for four days they were trying to figure out what do we say to not piss off too many of our own side. Right. I think that was the argument. And I think yeah. that is played in a, in a much bigger way uh, with, with certainly people on the right and really independents than the idea of, Biden showing a lot of solidarity here. So, well, Larry, right. Larry, what Tony's saying, I think, is so fascinating. I don't think it's getting covered enough. For four years of the Trump administration, it was you can't be on both sides of this issue. You have to condemn everything that is wrong, whatever. And yet these guys, all of the people that are siding with Hamas, with the barbaric acts that they have taken, the killing, the rape, the torture, the kidnapping, are all on the left. And yep. yet... We don't talk about where those people, it's just, there were protests at a school, at a college campus, outside the White House. It's not just, if this had been folks on the right, it would have been extreme right-wing MAGA-loving people, yeah. Donald That's Trump right. supporters are doing this. This time it's random people showed up. That's right. Listen, uh, Sean, the, 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 if there's a mass school shooting, God forbid, they already have the template. They know exactly what to say. Right. That's in their DNA. If there's some other horrific event that they can point to, you know, or the growing tide of domestic terrorism coming from the far right in America, they know exactly what kind of statement to put out. It's in their DNA. They've got the template. This is not in their DNA. Look at the people surrounding the president right now. Think. Look at the people who are advising the president. They don't have a, a reflexive support for Israel built into who they are and what their worldview is. So, of course, it took them forever to figure out what to say because they've never said it before. Uh, so it, it's it's maddening, as I said in my opening statement. It used to be a no-brainer that whoever the president was, we had complete and 100% support for whoever the prime minister right. of Israel is. That's now an open question. That's why he's got to fly over there. And that's terrifying frankly, and maddening, considering they're the only functioning democracy in the Middle East, and they've been our best ally. Uh, the people of Israel deserve better, frankly, and so do the people of America. All right, with all the uncertainty in the market, if you're looking for a place to secure your financial future, then head over to Bishop Gold Group. They are America's premier precious metals company. I use them. I've gotten to know them. Great individuals over there. And you know that we're living in this ever-changing economic landscape. Precious metals offered by Bishop Gold Group will give you the confidence you need when it comes to investing right now. We've seen it. The market's going up and down. Interest rates are all over the place. Costco is selling gold right now. But these guys know what they're talking about at Bishop Gold Group. They can sit down, whether you're a seasoned investor or just starting, give you a range of options from gold, silver, platinum, palladium to cater to your needs. So if you have an IRA that you want to move over, if you have just individual investing that you want to do, Bishop Gold Group understands your financial goals and they'll work with you to get the right precious metal uh, mix for you. You can hold it onto yourself. They'll hold it for you. I've literally asked them how you liquidate it. It's easy. Uh, these guys modeled business on transparency and integrity. I, I, Like I said, I know them. This is where I go. I ask you to go there as well. So you can reach out to them at 844-984- 1616 or visit bishopgoldgroup.com slash Sean for a special promotion and start your journey toward financial prosperity with precious metals. Bishopgoldgroup.com slash Sean. Robert Gates, the former defense secretary who served under two different administrations, is often quoted as saying, don't underestimate Biden's ability to F up a foreign policy situation. Do you think that he's gotten the policy right when it comes to Israel, or is this going to get added to the list? I don't know what the policy is in regards to Israel. And I don't speak for every Jewish person in America, but I would love to take a poll to see what Jews in America think of his policy position. I, I have no idea what it is. We know he's got this unbelievably frosty relationship with Netanyahu. Well, I'm calling it frosty. It's downright hate. That seems pretty obvious. You know that he's got a party that is thrilled with dead Jews. You've got college campuses, and they're all his voters, thrilled with dead Jews. You see these pro-Palestine rallies. It's not pro-Palestine. It's pro-Hamas. And we all know it. We understand the wordplay. So what exactly is his policy? His policy would be let Israel take small hits and small deaths for the next however many years that way, well, he's got another year in office uh, for another year while he's in office, as long as it doesn't bother him too much. The scope yeah. was too big. And that's the, the story here. But yeah. I haven't seen an actual change in policy from this administration. 
No, I think you're right. I don't, I don't know what it, it, it's like, let's just make sure that we're saying it's okay for Israel to hit back, but let's, uh, couch our bets a little. Larry, did you, yeah. before I move on, did you have, I, I couldn't tell. Well, actually, ironically, it was Obama who said, don't underestimate Biden's ability. You, to right, and then up. Gates Ga quoted. Gates is the man who said that Joe Biden's been on the wrong side of every foreign policy issue for his entire career. This is, you know, earlier this week, I, I mentioned this I want to thank Larry O'Connor for joining us. He's got to go now. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, but it spins the fact that he was wrong on every foreign policy issue. You know, when he was asked whether he really wants to run for a second term by Scott Pelley at 60 Minutes, his answer was yes, because imagine a world where things are calm in the <laughs> Middle East and we actually have countries forging relationships with Israel and Putin is put in his corner and Europe is actually free. Yeah, we don't have to imagine that world, Joe Biden. It existed three years ago before you came president. He wants to clean up the mess that he's created single handedly. He can continues to be wrong about every foreign policy issue. Uh, that's a perfect segue into what I want to talk about next, because I was up in New Hampshire and I spoke at the first in the nation summit. And, and the point that I made was this. In two and a half years, we've gone from a foreign policy where everybody was kind of in, in their box, right? Putin hadn't invaded anybody. Uh, Hamas hadn't fired any rockets. Iran was somewhat kind of in the corner. North Korea, at least, was having a dialogue with our president. Xi Jinping in China was a little kind of off, you know, wondering what's this Trump guy going to do? And he, he, they, they hadn't been as provocative as they clearly have now. And then domestic policy wise, I mean, obviously, inflation was at 2%. I, mean, I can go through the list, right? All that stuff has changed. The point that I was making in New Hampshire was, if you think about a political campaign and your dream opponent, you couldn't have cooked up a better, a, someone better to run against than Biden. Because you can literally just go down the list and say, this is everything that he's screwed up. And yet we're having this internal civil war, I think to some degree, uh, about who's best to lead it, the flaws of each other, et cetera, which is why you have, and here's where I'm going, which is why you have debates. The RNC this week announced that NBC, the home of Chuck Todd, Andrea Mitchell, Lester Holt, uh, Kristen Welker, et cetera, will be hosting that third debate in November. Larry O'Connor, um, would it have been better if they just let the DNC host the debate? Or do you think that having at least a three letter organization called the NBC run it made more sense? Yeah, I don't know. I, I really when when I turn to uh, some higher up in the mass media to sort of help f along the conversation amongst conservative Republicans as to who our best leader should be, I always think, gee, I wonder what Joy Reid has to say about this. I I really wonder what Lawrence O'Donnell thinks I should do with. What about Maddow? Do you care about Maddow? Oh, and that is a whole other thing. You're, now you're throwing eye candy at me, and that's just distracting, Sean. The point is, I think that the RNC once again has failed just enormously in not controlling their own. Right. That's event. the that's this the is nut. Their this debate. is sanctioned. Sanctioned. It's their debate. It's it's like it's like the NFL giving the Super Bowl to a network that knows nothing about football. Which well, no, could it's actually like the NFL giving the Super Bowl to the USFL and saying, why don't you guys run our our organization? I know that you're kind of not really our competition. I mean, but the difference or women's is soccer the, the, to carry the analogy further. Yeah, well, they're at least playing the same game. But I, I think the thing that <laughs> blows my mind is I believe that primary debates are supposed to inform primary and caucus goers and give them the best, right. right? There is no one at NBC. Andrea Mitchell has come out very clearly on what she thought about Ron DeSantis. And you go down the list of their hosts and what they have said about our candidates, whether it's Trump, DeSantis, et cetera. Tony Katz, I, listen, here's my prop, my point. Eight years ago, I ran these debates. We now have an ecosystem that includes the Blaze, the Daily Wire, the first, uh, go keep going, right? That could have, hosted debates, partnered with other ones. And as I've always said, you then allow C-SPAN to broadcast whatever they do to take care of any kind of, uh, you know, broadcast. And I mean, to, to allow the greatest audience possible to be able to watch these. And yet we're handing off the third debate to NBC. So a couple of things. Uh, first, fire Rona McDaniel and fire her now. Uh, that should have taken place after the first debate. That should have taken place after the second debate. Fire Rona McDaniel and fire. If I didn't say it uh, already, fire Rona McDaniel and fire her now. Uh, this didn't have to go to a network. What kind of 1983 thought process 
is this. This could have gone right to Rumble. We could have live streamed this thing on X and actually had it uh, show up as opposed to Ron DeSantis' announcement. We have all the tech and all the skill and all the people in the world to ask the right question that the people in our primary want to be asked. Right. We know the questions that our people are looking for. We speak to these people every day on radio. We hear from them every day on social media. There is no way for NBC to get this done properly. Just like you saw with Fox News bringing in Univision. Yes. The question, if you go back, the great question that was asked from the Univision host was to Vice President Pence, what is his take on the rise of hate crimes against LGBTQ people? That question is a nonsense question because the greatest rise is against Jews. And she would never ask that question, proving that the data isn't the thing that moved the question. The ideology is. We right. shouldn't be in this business at all, allowing their ideology to affect our primary. But, but look, Larry, Tony brings up a good point. After Univision and the disgraceful performance of that, the issues had not one of those questions. It was a waste of airtime. Every yeah. question that was asked, right? Why, I just don't get, like, how is there not greater backlash? No, I have no idea. I really, I don't, I don't know how much bigger the backlash could be. The ratings are down and uh, the people who do tune in and watch it pan this thing and they complain about it. But until the candidates take control of this situation and say, no, we're done with this, nothing's going to change. I don't know who fires Ronna McDaniel because she was elected by the, the members of the leadership committee, right, for the RNC. Uh, but I'll take you even one step further beyond the broadcast venue. Why are we buying into the idea that a professional teleprompter reader is the best person equipped yes. to moderate these Listen, events? So I'm going to tell you this. I, number one, I think instead of it, and I've said this before, any of us could, I mean, I, and I'm not looking to angle on this, but I mean, I think you have, you guys talk to people every day. I don't, right? I mean, I, I we host the show, we talk to guests, we have this, but you guys hear from callers and people, you know what's on the mind of grassroots conservative movement voters, right? So I'm in favor of saying, hey, here's what, you know, what we're hearing. I think a Glenn Beck, a Ben Shapiro, a Charlie Kirk. Uh, I mean, and I'm not sure, you know, Dana Lash. You can go down the list, but there are people who talk to our voters and our movement folks all the time about veterans issues, Second Amendment issues, life issues, uh, border issues, things yeah. that matter and where there's differences, frankly, and saying, hey, but the second part I would say to you, and this gets to the nut of what you're saying, is Mike Huckabee said to me at one point, we should just let give them a clock. Your clock runs down. You know, you get equal amount of time and, and an issue gets thrown out. The southern border, immigration, yeah. border security 100%. and go. And then yep. when your 10 minutes is up, your microphone turns out. If you want to talk for seven minutes about the southern border, go back and forth, whatever. But then the next issue comes up and we agree on like five, six issues per debate. They come out and you get to talk. But why brilliant. is it that we sit around and have, I mean, Tony's right. It was like a pretzel. Like how much do you hate your party's stance on the following issues? Yes, yeah, exactly. You're right. And Sean, and, and, the, and listen, I've been one of the people asking questions at these debates back in 2016, as you know. Uh, in New Hampshire. And I know what these journalists and teleprompt readers, what their goal is. I assure you, when George Stephanopoulos moderates a debate of Republicans, his job is to not try to glean as much information to better inform a Republican voter. His job is to try to trap those candidates and make a viral moment yes. and try to get his clip played over and over and over again. I, that I, doesn't serve our democracy. I, I, I agree. And I think that it's going to be interesting. You notice that they didn't announce the moderators. That was key. And they also didn't announce what role MSNBC was playing in this. And I know from at least, look, I called this debate weeks ago. I had had sources call me and say, hey, they're going to announce this. And as soon as people started calling, you know, the RNC for comment, they said, we can't confirm anything because they were going to be. I knew that they were embarrassed about this, but they also didn't announce the moderator. And there's a reason because I know as soon as it happens, they're going to be a problem. Here's my I will predict this today. It's it's I think they're going to put all their stock into Kristen Welker as the new host to meet the press and have her come out and do this. They'll announce Hugh Hewitt, who's great from Salem. He'll be a, yeah. he'll he'll be a voice of reason on this. And that will be their team. Now, maybe Lester Holt gets thrown in the mix as well, because I know there's always contractual issues that they have to abide by. The network say if you host this, I mean, this isn't an RNC thing. This is an NBC thing. But my guess is that if there's three people on that, it's going to be Holt, 
Kristen Welker and Hugh Hewitt. They'll give Hugh three questions so that they can say that they allowed this to happen. But I, I they're going to act like somehow that no one saw this coming. I've seen the movie. I'm going to, you know, I know how it ends and it's not good for our candidates. All right, if you are a guy and you are tired of wasting your money on testosterone booster products that don't work, I don't blame you. That's why our sponsor, Nugenix Total T, lets you try them before you have to buy. That's right, you can get a complimentary sample when you text 231231 and enter the keyword Spicer. Nugenix Total T Testosterone Booster and has Testafin. It will help you turn back the clock and re-energize your life but the key thing is you don't have to take their word for it. You can literally try before you buy. If it works, you keep using it. If not, you can stop using it, but you get to keep it. That's the best deal going right now. Come on, in this economy, you've got nothing to lose, but you could gain a lot. You could gain energy, muscles, drive, even more passion. So get that complimentary sample when you text 231 231 and enter keyword Spicer. Nugenics is the number one doctor recommended brand and the number one selling testosterone boosting brand at both GNC and at Walmart. And it can help re-energize your life and get you back to that, that person that you used to be. You know what I'm talking about. So if you're not satisfied, they're going to refund 100% of your money plus the shipping and the handling, literally nothing to lose. So call now or t go to text, rather, go to 231231, enter that keyword Spicer, and get a bottle of Nugenics Thermo-X, which is their newest and most powerful fat incinerator with key ingredients to help you lose stubborn fat fast and get lean. You get that absolutely free when you text 231231 and enter keyword Spicer. Once again, 231231, keyword Spicer. Texting enrolls you into recurring automatic text messages. Consent not required to purchase. Message and data rates apply. It's the number one doctor-recommended brand by primary care physicians based on an independent survey conducted by IQVIA 2002. I, I do want to move on to the other debate this week that is, is going up. There's a little bit of a debate between Candace Owens over at The Daily Wire and Megyn Kelly. Let me kind of read you in on this in case you're not following it. Basically, uh, there were these students, as we just talked about, all over the country that are protesting, siding with Hamas under the guise of supporting Palestine. And some of them are being blacklisted, right? They, there's a, a law firm in DC that said that they were withdrawing a associate or a summer internship from one of the students that got named. You saw Harvard dealing with taking down the names of some of these students that were part of this group. And Megan says, good, they should be blacklisted. Candace Owens comes out and says, wait a second, I was young and stupid once. We shouldn't you know, tar these kids for life because they were, they did something during college. Uh, I'll start with you, Tony Katz. Are you team Megan or team Candace? Uh, this is the cancel culture conversation in, in, a, in a different form. And, and I will tell you uh, that we have all seen somebody have their career ruined for an errant tweet they sent 10 years ago. And that, that's, and so no that's one, team Candace. And no one cared at all. Uh, the the people who are supporting Hamas, and it should be clear that they're not engaged in any pro-Palestine movement. They're engaged in Hamas support. They're engaged in the support of murderers. I think it is fine for someone to say, yeah, I'm not giving you a job. That is different than whether or not they'll get a job in the future. These people aren't guaranteed jobs. And the only way one learns in life is from actual experience where things don't work out. And I think that is part of, probably one of the most important lessons here. I'm we sorry. should not take away the lesson from these leftists that when you engage in horrible things, you might get a consequence. They're so used to getting a pass over all the things in all the places. They never get called to the carpet on what they've done. Here they have. So this isn't their career is over or life is over as we have seen happen all over the place. This is, you didn't get this job. There's another law firm out there that's happy to, to hire your leftism. Okay, I got this backwards. That's Team Megan. Megan's saying, hey, blacklist these kids. Larry, what, what, here's the, the counter argument that some of my team and I were talking about before, which is yeah. what if you belong to the Harvard such and such club? They put, you didn't know that your name was being associated with this. They put it on and now you're being blacklisted because of this. So that, that's, that's a nuance yeah. to this. What do you it, think? It is, it, 
This is super easy to resolve, really? frankly. I always like to go back to you know the Bible and uh, take a look at how you're supposed to deal with sins and repentance. See, uh, cancel culture is when you're a teenager and you put out a really horrific joke on social media, and it's clearly a joke. People try to ruin your life, and you say, listen, I'm smarter than that. I, I, I wouldn't say anything like that now. I've learned. I've grown. I repent. I'm sorry. And they still try to ruin your life, even when you say that. If these people want to not be blacklisted and they want to have a career and get that job that right now is in danger, it's really easy. All they have to do is repent. All they have to do is say they've learned. All they have to do is disavow it and actually actively work against those horrific evil people who they were once aligned with. But they're not asking for that. They're just asking for carte blanche. And to Tony's point, if they want a job, that's fine. But you know what? There's two college students right now sitting at one of these Ivy League schools. One of them threw down with the pro-Hamas lobby. The other one is a member of the Young America's Foundation chapter. I think the one at YAF should be rewarded before the one with pro-Hamas uh, tendencies gets the same kind of job. So I'll tell you what, let's hire all the young Republicans on campus and all the members of Young America's Foundation. And if there are any jobs left over, then maybe we can give one to the pro-Hamas. So, so that so is very Solomon right there. We're gonna <laughs> stay just splitting, splitting the baby. Look at him. Well, My because gosh. it's not just about punishing the person who did something wrong. How about rewarding those same age college right. students at the very same college who actually have a brain and actually have a moral compass and didn't do that, who actually mm -hmm. made the right choice? Let's reward them for that. But, Tony, I'll there's a lot wrong. of folks. There's a lot of folks on the on the on the right that have said canceling someone is wrong. So is it is it to the nut of what Larry's saying, which is the repentance is the key? Because a lot of the folks that, that came to Candace's side said, hey, we've been saying that cancel culture is wrong, so we shouldn't engage in it now. Is it cancel culture or is it the the, the means by which it happens, meaning you got to go Larry's route and repent? Well, I think Larry brings up an unbelievably good point that's worthy of, of some serious discussion. But if you look at the comic Louis C.K., uh, it was his career isn't allowed to come back. How dare you actually listen to his comedy again? It, the, what they wanted to do to Dave Chappelle was not only get him off Netflix, but nobody should listen to him uh, again for his, for his conversations. This list goes to actors and a whole host of, of, of people. That was about ending your career and Toto. You're never allowed to have a job again. You're never allowed to work again. This is a company saying, I'm not hiring you, but it's not an industry saying I'm not hiring you. So this, if we want to talk about the nuance of the repent and not, right, that, that nuance there, then there is this one, which is about whether or not we're saying the entire world of law isn't going to hire this uh, student president from NYU Law School. Someone's going to hire her. It just wasn't that firm in New York. So, Larry, the thing that's interesting is when it came to Ukraine and BLM, it was like the old Seinfeld. Why aren't you wearing the ribbon? And if you didn't come out and do it, you were bad. You know, you, why aren't you doing it? And, and I think for a lot of people, they felt just by not doing it. So let's just take this yeah. one step further. If you are actively sitting back, let's say that you are not on the extreme of supporting Hamas right now, but you are silent. Where do you fall on the scale? I, I listen. I again. I don't want to be the person deciding who gets canceled and who doesn't. No, who no, gets a job not and a cancel. But but do you, do you, it, like all these actors? I, I, I think, think in decided, particular. I think if this weekend you decided to watch college football instead of taking to the streets, waving a uh, Palestinian flag or an ISIS flag, saying "gas the Jews," yeah, I, I think that's okay. That silence is fine with me. It's the it's the actively going out of your way to right. actually throw down with the terrorists that I think are the problem. But I think the thing that's interesting to me is all of these folks who condemned everybody during BLM and said, if I don't see that, they took it a step further. The Hollywood, the woke types, the lefts said, if you're not standing with BLM, then, right. you know, we're. But but the thing that I find interesting is none of those same people are willing to stand against rape and murder and barbaric acts. Yeah, yeah, because they're Marxists without a moral compass. They, they, but, they're they on the bad guy's but, side. But Tony, literally. they don't, there's and, no- And the whole idea that, you know, it's not good enough to say you're not racist. In fact, if you say you're not racist, that means you are racist. It's the Ibram X. Kendi anti-racism model that is completely 
illogical and and morally skewed. Uh, that certainly can't apply to this scenario because, again, the only way you can come out and be actively anti-Semitic is then to be pro-Israel. And that doesn't wash with what these kids have been learning on a college campus for the last, well, three decades now. Tony, do you think the, as you've watched this unfold over the last week, has the media coverage of it? There was a piece that I was reading about how anchors were justifying some of the actions um, of the Palestinians. Do you think that they are reporting on it accurately or are they now somewhat siding with the Palestinians? I don't think it's a question of somewhat. I think that their natural inclination in way too many of these network jobs is to side with the Palestinians, that Israel is uh, well, should, the Palestinians, uh, that Israel is uh, the problem, that Israel is the impediment, that Israel is the issue. If Israel would just stop X, if Israel would just stop building Y, if Israel would just stop doing Z, and you know this by the hearing the term that this is the most extreme right-wing government in Israel's history. I assume some people would have thought that when Israel got formed, but I guess it's just now. And you keep hearing that over and over and over again to try and tie the Israeli government uh, to, a, when you hear the word extreme, of course, they bring up a former President Trump. That is proof positive of where they're at in this. So no, of, of, of the vast majority of what we've seen, at least on the cable news side and, and even in the broadcast side, has been despicable in this, in terms of who they brought on. They are want right. to engage in what Gad Saad referred to as amnesia of causality. They only want to focus on Israel's response. They don't want to focus on what happened here, which was Hamas, a terrorist organization, which is ISIS, butchered, raped, and burned alive 1,400 people. I thought the other thing that was interesting, Jews. Larry, uh, Steve Krakauer, who I think does a phenomenal job at Fourth Watch, was talking about how during the Trump administration, so many of these folks used single sources, right? So they would say, oh, yeah. according to someone, this happened. It was a fact, no debate about it, right? In reporting on what Hamas had done, they'd say allegedly killed a young woman right. or, yeah. uh, you know, unconfirmed did this to a young child or whatever. And it was like, wait a second. So now you guys are worried about your sourcing before when it was anti-Trump. It was, we don't really care if it's true or not. We got a guy that says it's okay. When there are pictures, there was one of the examples that he gave in his Fourth Watch newsletter where he literally says that despite photographic evidence, because the reporter hadn't seen the atrocity, that they couldn't say it was confirmed. Yeah, no, it's a great point, actually. I mean, I, it, you know, the, all these Hamas terrorists are probably watching that saying, guys, we used body cams and threw it on TikTok for a reason. And now you're saying allegedly, come on, give us right. the credit. We want it here. They, they literally put it out there on social media for everybody to see. And and to, to your point about whether the media is biased here, here, I'll, I'll give all of your viewers a clue here. If you hear any journalist or anchor either using the term occupation or letting their guests use the term occupation, you know that they're liars because we all know that Israel hasn't occupied Gaza for close to 20 years now, number right. one. And number two, when they say occupation, the, the anchor, the host, Jake Tapper, I'm begging you, do this just once. Stop the interview and say, could you define occupation for me, please? Right. Because from the position of <laughs> Hamas and Hezbollah and Iran and all of the pro-terrorist lobby out there, when they say occupation, they mean the existence of Israel. Right. They mean the political boundaries that were defined in 1948. To them, that's what occupation is. So when you hear some college professor or a member of the Democratic Party in the House of Representatives saying the same thing, they mean get rid of Israel. Right. And unless they call them out on it, they're part of the problem. I, I want to switch gears and get uh, a, your take on a story that was in the Washington Post that <laughs> excuse me, blew my mind. This was the headline here. A trans woman joined a sorority, then her new sisters turned on her. A 21-year-old University of Wyoming student was looking for community. Instead, she faced death threats, a federal lawsuit, and an attempt to kick her out. Okay, so you read this and you think, wow, this is just this woman who's trans. It's so sympathetic. She's looking to belong. What the Washington Post never told us was that this woman apparently had several instances of feeling, making people feel uncomfortable. Another sister in the sorority alleges that she was weird at a slumber party, 
Quote, he would not leave until after the girls fell asleep. He was supposed to leave by 10 p.m. when the lights had been turned off and other pledges were trying to sleep. He started singing, God yes, God rest ye merry gentlemen, himself in the corner of the room. He did not leave until midnight. The next night he stood silently in the corner near the other does where the pledges were changing from their sleeping garments into clothing. All of these things that the sisters in the sorority felt uncomfortable about. A lawsuit was filed. They had gone to the university. And yet the post makes it, seem like it's just this young, confused, 21-year-old transgender person looking to fit in, Tony Katz. Well, uh, I don't know why the sorority let him in to begin with. And uh, there's a difference between men and women. And men are not women and women are not men. So I won't use uh, pronouns that are inappropriate here. Uh, I don't know why they let him in. Why did well, there you was invite a lawsuit. this in? That, I mean, that you were, for, you were wait. The lawsuit stated that they were forced to let him in to a sorority? Well, no, the, the, the sorority let him in, but the, the women, seven of the sisters, were working with lawyers to oust this person. And on March 27th, they filed a lawsuit in federal court against Artemis and Kappa Kappa Gamma. So they, yeah. the, the, the sorority let him in. And at least seven of these sisters who've now faced total backlash were right. saying, we have a problem here. This, this individual... Um, was asking random questions, uh, was taking pictures of their pledges without consent, attending oh, a yoga terrible. class, watching, instead of participating, stood in the back. Yeah. And, 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 and this is why I started with, why, why did you let him in to begin with? And if you now have the seven of you who recognize that this is madness, you're supposed to quit. You're supposed to walk out and say, my God, I just avoided a, a bullet here. Who would want to be around this crazy? These, these, these chicks don't understand feminism to begin with. And then wow. go about starting your own or joining somewhere else. Right. Well, I mean, that's I, only it part is of amusing the that it is, Sean, it is amusing that the Washington Post finally found this story and then presented it to their readers the way they did. Uh, the other residents of Washington, D.C. who listened to my radio program, they knew about this story six months ago when it first came up. So a little late to the game. And uh, yeah, but and the you fact didn't. Is, wait, wait, hold on. But you didn't present it. You, no. you. Yeah. I mean, let's just be clear. Here's how I presented it. Here's how I presented it. The national sorority forced this local charter to take this person. They didn't want to take him. Right. He came in. The, the young man is a predator. He is fully biologically intact as a male and would get visibly aroused around these young 19 to 21 year old women. Maybe I'm old fashioned, but I think young girls, number one, should be protected from male predators who are getting sexually aroused against their will around them in private spaces. And number two, very old fashioned, but I think a young woman in college, she should actually grant consent before she has to seal, see a naked intact male genitalia. I know that's old fashioned these days, but they have every right to complain about this. And the fact that the Washington Post painted this guy, a predator, a sexual predator as the victim shows you how skewed we have become in the world of journalism. T Tony, do you think that the tide turns in this issue? I mean, look, I mean, Larry's point, yes. right? That, that, that we now start seeing that you have a predator in a, in a, in a sorority, right? That these women are feeling uncomfortable. They feel that their safety is being threatened. Is there, is there a tide turns where it says, okay, enough's enough. We're not, we're not putting up with this. Or have we lost this argument? No, no, no. I, I, I think it already has turned. I think Riley Gaines has helped make a turn. I think oh, these yeah. Connecticut high school students who sued to be able to compete against other girls have made the tide turn. I think that when you see uh, laws uh, across the country being implemented to ensure uh, that uh, boys play boys sports and girls play girls sports. Here in Indiana, we had to override the veto of the Republican governor, Eric Holcomb, in order to get it done, but it got done. The tide is absolutely turning. Now, Amen. they'll scream hate, they'll scream you're a bigot, they'll scream you're leading kids to suicide. Uh, kids need to be protected more often than not from themselves and certainly from people who think that other children should suffer. If you think young girls in sports or women in colleges should suffer because some guy makes a decision, I think you're a weird cat and we should discount those people to begin with. Larry, do you, I mean, do you, do you agree? I mean, have we, is the tide going to turn back or is it? I, I think, 
I think the pendulum has already swung. Polls show now just two years after uh, the pushback uh, that that the public is actually now against allowing biological men into women's sports, allowing biological men into women's private places. Um, and yes, Riley Gaines is a big part of it. Don't forget the group behind Riley Gaines, the incredible women at Independent Women's yep. Forum here in Washington, led by Carrie Lucas and Julie Gunlock and Patrice Onwuka, who have really carried this not just on television and to get a lot of attention, but in the halls of Congress to try to move legislation forward. Uh, the fact that the Biden administration wants to rewrite Title IX to include men who pretend to be women, yep. as if back in the early 70s, Title IX was uh, conceived for that reason, it's outrageous. And it's a winning political issue. Glenn Youngkin proved that in Virginia. And I hope our next Republican nominee for president will make this a major issue moving forward. You want to see- Because the, peop- the pendulum has swung. You want to see, Larry, real misogyny. That's exactly the one. The rewrite of Title IX is, is the proof of leftist misogyny. It's erasing the hatred women. of women. Yep. Yep. All right. Tony Katz, Larry O'Connor. I think we, this has been a fun discussion. Thank you both for joining us. It has. Thank and you, thank son. you to Tony's beard. It's magnificent tonight. <laughs> I try my best to make the place look good. All right. Thank you, boys. <laughs> All right. Well, I really enjoyed the, uh, that discussion with those guys. We covered a lot of ground. I mean, Israel... The debates, I don't know. Do you come down pro Candace or pro Megan? Uh, text me, 571-441-4991. Let me know, are you team Megan? Are you team Candace? What do you think about that? Uh, or go to seanspicershow.com slash VIP. Give me your feedback there. Or obviously in the YouTube and the Rumble comments, you can tell me as well. But I think this is really interesting for a bunch of folks that have said, no more cancel culture. What do we think about these folks? What should these young students should they have to pay a price or not? Anyway, uh, tomorrow, Carol Swain is here and Congressman Kevin Hurd of Oklahoma. He's the chairman of the Restu- Republican Study Committee. Uh, looking forward to that discussion. Thanks for all of your support for the show. Please continue to share this with others. Subscribe both on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. And we'll see you right back here tomorrow on The Sean Spicer Show. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get more.